And Father, I pray that we'll focus our attention now, Lord, on your word this morning, Lord. And we know good and well if you don't come down and open our minds and our hearts and open your word, Lord, it's just uh, up here is a tinkling symbol, Lord, making no sense, God, but we ask for your touch now. Lord, would you bring the lesson across this morning, place us back in time now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to continue in part two this morning of the hours come. We talked last week about uh, <clears throat> the Old Testament pictures there of Calvary, and this morning we're going to uh, continue our journey with our Lord to the three places that he shed his precious blood, which he came here to do on earth. Uh, I say we're going to go to the three places. I thought we might. We're not going to make it to all three of them this morning. Uh, after putting everything together from this week, and I come to the conclusion this morning, I got two and a half pages, so there ain't no point in even trying to get to the others. Uh, you know how it is. We'll get struggling to get through that. But... Um, you know, he, he come to take our place, and that's it, something that he, he chose to do. Uh, he done nothing to deserve to leave his throne in glory and come to earth to die, but he loved us enough to do just that. And I know we're coming up on this time of Easter, and, and uh, it's a favorite time of year, as we mentioned a little bit last week. But uh, he loved us enough to come and die for us, so... Uh, today we're going to look at the Garden of Gethsemane, and this is where it started, and uh, then we'll look next week, and we'll try to handle Gabbatha next week and Golgotha, maybe. We can get through both of them. I'm going to try to condense them together next week and look at that, because, uh, you know, there's not a, a, really a lot written about Gabbatha, but we know it as the Judgment Hall, and we'll... We'll pick up that in the life of Jesus next week. But as we're tracing our steps here in Luke of Jesus in Luke 22, in verse 39 through 46, and he came out and went as he was uh, as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, "Pray that ye enter not into temptation." And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And, he, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being, I want you to catch this now, we're going to come back and deal with it in just a moment. Being in and agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground and when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples he found them sleeping for sorrow and he said unto them why sleep ye rise and pray lest you enter into temptation now if you're looking you ain't got to turn there but in the gospel of Matthew's account and also in Mark, you'll see that uh, there was three times. And I know around here we're very, very familiar with this scene, okay? And, and it's easy for us to sit back and say, yeah, ho-hum, we do it in Easter play every year and we have for 20 years. We see this every time. So it's easy for us to get in that mindset. Uh, but as we dig into the scriptures... You know, there's a lot that took place that we can't produce up there. We're limited in time. We're limited in uh, abilities. We're limited in everything. Matter of fact, all that Jesus did, the Bible says in the end of the Gospel of John, if all things were written that he done, the world couldn't contain the books. <laughs> so listen, there's no way we can touch on everything. But... It's easy for us this time of year as we go through the play and go through the play and practice and practice and practice and practice that you lose this. And it's easy, I know, because I've been in this scene. I've been in some more scenes in the play. I've been in several different characters. And it's easy to just focus on your character. And that's what you ought to do, by the way. 
because of what we're doing here. But I want us to put ourselves back in this garden area. Now, this is the first place in Gethsemane where Jesus starts to shed his blood. Now, I personally, and this is just a personal belief, I have no scripture to back it up. I don't think he, I don't think he ever cut his leg. I don't think he ever done anything like it. I don't think any of his blood ever come out until starting right here. Why? That blood was royal. That blood was in him for a special thing. He had to be the one to pay that sin debt for us. So I believe this is the first time here that he starts the, uh, as we're tracing his life up to Golgotha, here a lot is going on in the life of our Lord. And as we go through this study in the next couple of weeks, just remember, he did this for you and I. He did it for you and I. Now verse 39, as we'll start out here in Luke 22, he came out and went. Now you can go back and read the, we're not going to take the time to read what all took place. Matter of fact, before you get to this place, uh, you can go read John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 because John really got into what took place before he left. But something interesting, and uh, we'll make it and mention here in a moment, is John only mentioned the garden in chapter 18 and verse number 1, and he went right on to the arrest. Now, ain't that something? You say, well, he should have spent more time on that, but look what he give us <laughs> in those four chapters there that the other writers didn't. So it, it, it all comes together. But verse 39 here says, uh, he says, and he came out and went as he was wont. Now, as he was wont simply means it was a custom to him. It was a manner. Now, in John 18, 2, Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. I ask people all the time, and I try to get us to get a place nailed down to where we know we can meet God. Now, one of the things in, in the different places I've lived in, I, I've had to find a place to meet God. And some of you have been in the same house forever. That's cool. I hope you got a place in that forever house where you can get alone and meet God. But each time I move, I have to go and find that place. And sometimes I have to move around. But I've always learned this. Wherever we'll get along with God and His Word and, and we'll seek Him, God will meet us. But the place, this was a different place. There was something different about this time as we're coming up to the life of our Lord. And, and, and so in verse 39, he says, as he was wont. So it was his custom, and, and even his disciples knew. Just about every time they would pass this garden, you know, Jesus was going to stop in there at some point. And it was always a place of prayer. Ain't it amazing how Judas knew exactly where he would be. He didn't announce it, but it was a place he oftentimes, as the scripture talks about, would resort to. Now, uh, he, he resorted to is what John said in John 18 and verse 2. And of course, in my crazy warped way of thinking, I always think when I hear resorted, I think about a resort. <laughs> we all like to go to all-inclusive resort. I guess I've never been to one. I don't know. I've been to a lot of places, but I've never been to all inclusive. And I guess because I don't drink, so you know, they say that's about the only deal if you go to one. But I, I don't know. Maybe you've been to them and they're good. And I'm gonna try them one day, cause you know, one day I'm gonna be out of baby step three, and we're gonna move on and start doing those kind of things. But right now we're not, and so. But I thought about the resort. He, but it's a place he always went to. There was a place. Although he was God, yet he went and met with his father. I don't know, was he, in, was he in the garden in John 17? I don't know. Was he still in the upper room? I know he was apart at some point to pray. He would always go alone to pray, and that ought to teach us something. 
But he oftentimes resorted there. Now, verse 40 says, And when he was at the place, Pay attention to these little things in the Word of God. When he was at the place, you see, our Lord knew the hour had come. Now, let's put ourselves where he is at at this time. Remember the title of the lesson for this week and last week and the next week. The hour has come. He knew that hour had come. He knew when he stepped foot into this familiar place. At this time, there was definitely something different. I'm sure Jesus, being God that he is, he could feel the pressure of this hour, of this particular time in the garden. Now, let me just take a little trip back in my mind, and maybe let's place something there, but let's take a trip back to creation, if you would. When he created the very dirt, see, I think about things like this. I, you know, expounding on the scriptures and, and thinking about what all God has done and but as creation, when he created the dirt and he formed this earth by his spoken word, during this time, like every other place, he particularly fitted this place together. This was a special place to the Lord. <laughs> this particular part of his creation, he'd done just that. Now, he, he may have at some point, uh, you know, looked at that place and said, after he created it, and went on and created something else, maybe he looked at that place and said, I'll see you again in about 4,000 years. See, don't believe all this stuff about the earth's 500 million and billions a year old. It's not. Not according to the Word of God. I'm just going to believe God. <laughs> I mean, that's what I choose to believe. But so here he is, maybe he created this, and he looked at that part of the ground and said, I'll see you again in about 4,000 years or so. At some point, someone sprouted an olive tree, or they broke off a vine of an olive tree. By the way, you ought to read about the olive tree, especially what Paul lays out in the book of Romans in chapter 11, and, and how that God is able to take that wild vine and graft it into the to the olive tree and that take a broken vine, talking about Israel, and graft them back in again, telling the Gentiles not to be boasting. But God's able to do this thing. There's the, the special meanings of trees all throughout the Word of God. But some point, someone had to, you know, sprout up this particular olive tree that was alone in the garden here. And I don't know which one it was, but God knew it was. You see, God knew the tree that he growed. You know, he knew the tree that was going to be Calvary. He knew it. One day, that tree started sprouting up. Didn't look like much to start with. You know, just a little sprigling coming up out of the ground. But ain't it amazing? That tree made it, and it growed into a tree, and, and somebody had to come along and cut that tree down, and I'm, I'm sure he walked by that tree. He said, that's the one right there. I don't know. That tree may be in glory one day. We might see it again. I don't know. But hey, somebody seen that, that, that olive tree, and they, they planted it among these olive trees. And maybe God looked at the one. He said, you will be the one I'll be hanging on in a few years, talking about the time he's in agony here in the garden. As the stones were created and through the process of being unearthed. You see, uh, you, don't, you can't see stones sometimes till you start digging. But those stones have been there. Man, who, who loves to start digging and hit rock? Only a grading man and a septic tank man because they can start charging the money then, buddy. <laughs> but all those stones in the ground, well... And through the process of being on earth, they appeared in the garden. But I'll report to you, even while that stone was covered in the earth, Jesus knew which one of those drops of blood that would come out of him would land on a specific stone. Or even before the stone was revealed to the eyes of man, he knew exactly who it was and which one it was. I'm sure as a child he would walk by and look at that garden and say the hour was coming one day soon. You see, now he's on the earth and he's walking, and he's created this place thousands of years earlier, 
Now he's walking by as a child, looking at the God. Maybe he stopped walking with his mom and dad sometimes, looked at that garden and said, that hour was coming. I'm going to be there one day. All this is going to come to a head and come to a season. The hour was coming one day soon that I'll start the process of redemption in this very place. I'm sure he looked at that. You see, oftentimes during his ministry, he would resort to this very place. He would go there. He knew one day he would enter into this garden, and on that day, something's going to be different. See, he knew that day coming. You've got to understand, they knew where they would find him. He had a place he often resorted to. And so here they are going to it, but something's going to be different about this time. See, something's brewing. It's kind of like stuff been in a coffee maker percolating, you know. All this stuff is percolating. And sooner or later, that, that whistle's going to go off, amen. That steam's going to come out. Something, redemption is coming to a head here in the scriptures in our life as we're following him. Something's going to be different this time. His disciples was used to stopping by this garden. You say, how do you know that? Well, they knew where to find him. They knew he would be there. They knew they was used to stopping by this garden. I don't know how many times he would go by this garden and just stop in and pray. It's not recorded. But I do know he went there a lot and prayed and went there by himself and prayed. So they, they was used to stopping by this garden. The only thing they was thinking at this time, because you got to understand now, they're wore out. They're tired. They're ready to sleep. The only thing they knew at this time, finally, I can get some rest. See, they were so used to Jesus going off by himself praying. And he would. He'd leave them there. And he would go off. Well, they knew he was a, <clears throat> he didn't go do his little popcorn prayers and leave and come back and move on. They was ready for some rest. And so they thought, oh, okay, this place again. This is where we're stopping after all the teaching he's done in the upper room in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. All this teaching, we end up here in this garden. You see, they didn't realize what was taking place. And you'll read the other accounts in the gospel, you'll see that Jesus, after the third time coming to them, finally said, just sleep on. Just sleep on. You want to sleep? Uh, you don't talk about pre preaching a message. You can preach a message on the church's asleep. Because I really think it is. I think we're so in routine and we're so used to doing the whole, it becomes whole hum to us. This play can become whole hum to us. These events we do around here called Easter play or He is Alive and Judgment Journey. We can talk the talk, we can go through the emotions, but if inside we get tired, we're no different than these disciples, we're ready to just go to sleep and right in the middle of what God is doing. But each gospel writer here has his own take on this account. John only mentions, as I said, in John 18, 1. While Matthew points out in the book of Matthew, he makes it in Matthew 26, verse 37, you read on down there, Jesus began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then if you read in verse 38, he said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. In other words, if you look that up in the Greek, My soul is overcome with sorrow so much as to cause one's death. Do you know there is a certain syndrome called the broken heart syndrome. People say he died of a broken heart or she died of a broken heart. That's a scientific fact. Here he is with so much sorrow at this point. He said exceeding sorrowful. That means his soul is overcome with sorrow so much as to cause one's death. Now no doubt 
The devil wished he would have died in that garden. Of course, he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. But he was going to go all the way to Calvary. Verse 39 of that same text in Matthew. I love this. The first part of that says, he went a little farther. <laughs> he went a little farther. Sometimes we're going through stuff in life. We just got to keep going. There'll be good days ahead. There'll be better days. The sun's going to shine again. It may not seem like it, but joy is going to come in the morning. Here he went a little further as he went on. That, like that song says, he went all the way from me, from heaven's throne to Calvary, leaving me just that one little step to take. He went all the way from me. But back in Luke 22, in verse 44, watch this. Now, I pointed out this phrase as we read through it a while ago. And being in an agony. That little word, an. You see the difference? Now, you go read some of the, the other versions, an is not in there. It's in some of them, but it's not in a lot of them. Being in an agony. You look that up, that means a struggle for victory. See, something was different when he entered the garden this time. He knew what was going to take place. He knew the hour had come. And this means a struggle for victory, of a struggle of severe mental struggles and emotions, agony, anguish. And so most modern day, they leave out that word and. But like only Luke, the physician, can do, and that's why I wanted to look at his, work, his recording of it this morning. Like only Luke and his physician can do, he put a little nugget like that in there to describe the intensity of the moment. And being in an agony, in a warfare, in a, 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 a severe mental struggle, you see, he knew what it was like to struggle. He knew what it was like. He knows what it's like when we're struggling. He's moved with a feeling of our infirmities. He experienced everything and more than we'll ever experience. He took it all. He became all for us. So he describes the intensity of the moment. Luke, the physician, also adds something very important that other writers leave out. Here in this verse, his sweat was it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. You see that there? Being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, the first thing the Bible critics is going to tell you is there's no way that's possible. But science says it is. You want to put that up there, brother? And look at this uh, description here. This is from the scientific study of it. Let's see. Yep, there it is right there. Hema to hydrosis. And that occurs in the bleeding disorder it may occur in individuals suffering from extreme levels of stress around sweat glands there are multiple blood vessels in a net like form which constrict under the pressure of stress and then as it is up there and then as the anxiety passes the blood levels or the blood vessels dilate to the point of the rupture and goes into the sweat glands, and the sweat glands produce a level, uh, a lot of sweat. They push the blood to the surface, which comes out as droplets of blood mixed with sweat. Now put that picture up there, brother. Look at this. That's a 12-year-old girl, and I can't show her face. By the way, this 12-year-old girl, you study it, she doesn't have a blood disorder. But this stuff starts happening to her. You see the blood 
coming out. Well, here he is in the garden. You can take that down, brother. But here he is in the garden. He prayed more earnestly. And I love the way Luke writes this. More intently. You see, you look through Luke's writings, man, even in the book of Acts, you'll see Luke, man, it, his position, it just comes out. You know, just like I can't help it. I'm in the building business, and I'm a carpenter, and, and the stuff just comes out. Amen. Doctors and, and, and lawyers and whoever, I mean, whatever your position is, man, it, you're going to tie the scripture in with your line of work, with your occupation. Luke, he said he prayed more earnestly. That means more intently. Something was different about the prayer this time. Luke uses the phrases and agony more earnestly. The neat thing about these two Greek words, if you look them up, Agony in your Strong's Concordance is Greek uh, 74, if you look it up, and more earnestly is Greek word 1617. These words to describe what our Lord was experiencing was only used one time. That's just something that Luke can just bring that kind of stuff out. I'm telling you, he goes into the debt. These words are only used one time in the Greek. And he talks about his sweat with great drops of blood falling to the ground. So why was our Lord feeling this way? Well, I told you something was different. This was a prayer meeting like he, he ain't never prayed before. And, and at this time, the disciples was what? Sleeping. They was wore out. They thought, oh, good, man, we can go to the garden you know, we've, we've had some good naps over here in this garden while God's been over there praying. The hour had come over him to drink of the cup. So that's, what, that's why he was feeling this way. The hour had come to drink of the cup of our sin, not his. You remember what the scripture says? He who knew no sin became sin for us. You notice... The scripture didn't say he became a sinner for us. God is very clear in what he says in his word. He who knew no sin became sin, singular, for us. That's why God turned his back on him that day on the cross. That's why he took this cup and he drank it. Because in this cup was not his sin, but ours everybody's sin. You, it, it's your sin that you've ever committed, that you ever will commit, or even the ones you and I have never even thought of. It was in that bitter cup. You remember, this was the cup his disciples, when they was going around saying, tell us who's the greatest in the kingdom. Will it be me? Is it I? You know, they started bickering amongst each other. And... Mama got involved. Had to get her two cents in, didn't you? Tell me, which one of my sons is going to be the best? It's going to be the greatest. What did Jesus say? He said, can you drink of the cup that I'll drink from? You know what the answer was? Oh, yeah, we can. <laughs> Jesus said, y'all got no idea what you're talking about. So here it is in the Garden of Gethsemane. The anguish is so powerful on our Lord. He's fixing to drink this cup. He said three times, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. There in verse 42 of our text, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, Luke only mentions it once. You read the other writers, you'll see three times. Well, if you'll read Matthew and Mark, You'll see three times he wanted this cup to pass. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So as we seen our Lord this morning in the Garden of Gethsemane, now next week, Lord willing, we'll look at Gabbatha and we'll look at Golgotha. Father, thank you for your words this morning. Pray that you'd bless us now as we go in this worship hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here this morning.